Romans chapter number three. I've been reading through uh, Romans in uh, my da- daily Bible reading, and I want to unpack some things to you this morning uh, that I think will help you. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, want to help you this morning. You know, Romans is probably when it comes to theology, what to believe about salvation. Romans is a book that it doesn't matter if you are a secular person, a non-believer, or if you are a believer, Romans stands on its own as one of the great literary masterpieces ever written. The Apostle Paul penned an unbelievable book when he wrote the book of Romans. And it's, it's my belief that as Christians, you and I should know the book of Romans. And I, and I, I want to... I, I've, I'm studying through this book because it's so important on, on my own, and I'm just going to unpack some of the things that I've learned. And um, I just want to, some of it will be a refresher, but all of it will be a reminder that will help you. Romans is, it begins with a problem. And it's the problem that um, we all in, encounter and we all face. And it's the problem that religion has tried to answer. It's a question that has been posed that religion's tried to answer for, for a long, long time. And the problem is this, and this is what the book of Romans addresses. And as I'm studying this, I'm seeing this more and more. God had a problem. And the problem was, and you're going to see this at the end of, of chapter 3 that I'm going to show you. God is just God is just. Coda and I were talking about this on the way to church because we try to read a few verses of Scripture every morning as a family. Andrea and Ella are not here, so Coda and I read them a little bit together and just prayed together before we come to church. And I read these, and we were talking about justice. Do you know what justice is? Justice is what is on the inside of you when you see an atrocity, when you see somebody done wrong. You scream for something to be done. When you see somebody, you turn on the news and somebody has been murdered. You scream for justice. When you see a dictator in a third world country use chemical weapons, say, on his own people, like we're seeing in the Middle East today, something on the inside of you screams out for justice. When you see a little child that doesn't have clothes to wear or food to eat, something screams out to you from the inside of you and says, that should not be that way and that needs to be fixed. That's called justice. God is just. Now, I'm not going to get into all the attributes of God this morning, but I I want you to understand every time that you come on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, I want you to leave having learned something. And here's what I want you to remember this morning, because there's so much emphasis and I, and I love it because it is true. There's so much emphasis on the love and the grace of God today in the church, but there's not so much emphasis on the justice and holiness of God. Let me tell you something. Before anything else, God is holy. He's holy. If you read Revelation, if you read the uh, prophetic uh, 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 glimpses that we get, maybe Isaiah or John the Revelator got, when we get to see inside the throne room of God, what do you see? You see creatures, great and small, around the throne crying what? Holy, holy. Holy, holy. I believe the three cries of holy are symbolic and tie closely with the Bible's teaching of that that God is three in one. He's triune. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So I believe that each of the three members of the Godhead receive a holy there. He is holy, holy, holy. That means that he cannot and will not be around sin. That's a problem for me. That's a problem for you, isn't it? That's a problem for man. 
We've always grappled with that, and that's what Paul tackles in the book of Romans. You see, God had a problem. He was holy, and he was just. How many have ever heard the little phrase that Paul uses later on in Romans? He says, for the wages of sin is death. You guys have heard it before, huh? The wages of sin is death. That means that God predetermined that anybody who sins, anyone who sins is worthy of death. The wages of sin is death. Now that word wage is not what God wants to give you. It has nothing to do with what God wants to do. It has to do with this. That's what you've earned. Wages speaks to the fact that you have earned that, right? Guess what I've earned in my life? I've earned death and I've earned hell. That's what I've earned. That's what Brandon Matheson deserves. Sometimes you and I get and we think that because we do a few good deeds and we, 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 we kind of have a streak going of, of, of you know, kind of doing good. We think, oh man, I deserve more than this. You know what you deserve? You deserve death. You deserve hell. That's what we deserve. The wages of sin is death. And we have to understand that before God is anything, God is holy. God said the wages of sin is death. Sin has to be paid for by death. That's what God said. So God has a problem. He created mankind. He made us in his image, right? And what did we do? We sinned. And so God's pride and joy, God's the ones that he had given his image to, the ones that he doted on, the ones that he walked with have rebelled against him. They've sinned, but their sin and his love for them did not do away with his holiness, right? Something had to die because the wages of sin, it doesn't matter if it's Adam's sin, it's death. Doesn't matter if it's Eve's sin, it's death. Doesn't matter if it's Brandon's sin, it's death. Doesn't matter if it's anybody's sin, it's death. Doesn't matter if it's a, a, a pagan person, it's death. Doesn't matter if it's a religious person, it's death. And God's holiness does not change. Because God is just. God is just. God does not, when you get saved, he does not lessen your sentence. He doesn't say, hey, because I love them, I'm not going to be so hard on them. That's not what salvation does. In fact, that is not at all what salvation does. God is just, and somebody has to bear death for that sin. That's where Jesus comes in. Somebody has to have the condemnation and the judgment for that sin poured out because yes, God is love. Yes, God is grace. But first and foremost, God is holy. And God is just. God will not let me or you skate with sin. Sin has to be atoned for. Sin has to be paid for. And by the way, every person in the world, their sin has to be atoned for or paid for or God cannot allow you to be righteous and go to heaven. He cannot. Because if he did, he would not be just. Because you earned salvation. You earned death. If he gave you salvation just because he decided to lessen the sentence on you, he would not be just because that's not the just thing to do. It would not appease his holiness. This is the problem that Paul grapples with. Here's, here's the deal. How many of you ever heard of Socrates? I'm going to show you how smart I am here this morning. I, heard, I, I read a quote one time with Socrates in it. I don't know who he was, right? Uh, no, Socrates lived a long, long time ago before Jesus was even born. He was a philosopher. And he said this, and I want to read it to you, and I want to make sure I get it right. Here's what he said. It may be that deity can forgive sins. It may be that deity or God can forgive sins, but I don't see how. That's what he said. How in the world can God, who is holy and just, forgive sins? He said, I don't understand that. He said that hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. Socrates said that. Because that is the whole crux of Romans chapter 1. God, who is holy and just, sin has to be paid for. His justice demands payment for sin, but 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loved. How does his love and his justice balance out? Because God is holy. He will not be around sin. Justice is demanded for sin. That justice demands death on the part of you and me, the sinner. But how does that balance with God's grace and his mercy? That is the subject of Romans. You see, if you study the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 1, you're going to find something. And we looked at this a few weeks ago, if you were here on Wednesday night, when we were talking about the Tower of Babel. How many of you remember what I said what, when we were teaching on the Tower of Babel and, and what happened with Romans 1, that God gave them up to other gods? Remember that? Okay. Romans chapter 1 says twice that God gave them up to something. Or God gave them over, it says, one, one time. So three different times, God gave them up or God gave them over to something. Romans chapter 1 deals with pagan people. Now, pagan people are this. Let me, let me show you what, what, what I mean when I say pagan. Romans chapter 1 deals with this. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 says this. Romans 1, 21. Did I give you that one, Paul? No, it's all right. Just hang right there. I'll read it. Here's what he says. Romans 1.21 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now watch this. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. He said, Brandon, what in the world does that mean? It means that some people in the world do not like to retain the knowledge of the God of the Bible. And so they will make themselves their own God and they will make an image and they will worship that image. It's called pagan worship. We've seen it down through the centuries, down through the thousands of years. Different people rise up and they'll say, hey, we want you to worship this image called Baal. We want you to worship this image called Molech. We see it all throughout the Old Testament, don't we? People were worshiping idols made of stone and brick. And, and believe it or not, even to this day, okay, not so, we don't see so much of it in our American culture, but let me say something. It's there, okay, it's there. You just don't see it. Can I tell you something? I heard a missionary say this the other day. Because people are always like, well, it's easy to serve God in America. It's easy to serve God in America. You know what these missionaries said? They said they used to live in a, in a, in a third world, uh, in a communist country. And they said the persecution of the church in that country actually brought them together. And they were more of a family because they were being persecuted. But when they came to America, they found that it was harder for them and their families to stay close to God and worship God because they said, and these, this is what these missionaries said, they said there's more demons in America and other gods attacking America. It's harder to serve God in America than it is on a, on a foreign field. That's what they said. They said, the, the missionaries said, we didn't have to battle the demons that come with drunkenness and drug abuse. We didn't have to battle the sexual demons. We didn't have to battle all of that. America is just riddled. It's a cesspool of those. And that's what they said. It's harder to serve God there than it is in a communist country where you're persecuted. Pagans. Well, they do. Bow down and worship this idol. Worship this. Worship that. Paul says, you know what? The pagan people. They're sinners. Then in chapter 2, he goes on to somebody else, and here's what we come down to, and we kind of see Paul breaking down humanity into three different groups. The first is this, and I'll tell you, I almost brought my whiteboard out here uh, this morning, but I decided not to because somebody called me the Glenn Beck of pastoring. Uh, remember how Glenn Beck used to do that on his show? He'd bring a whiteboard out and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, anyway, but, uh, 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 but uh, uh, chapter number 2, first of all, he tells us there's pagan people in the world that say, you know what? I don't want to worship the God of the Bible. I'm going to make my own God. Then chapter 2 tells us that there are moral people who like to retain God in their conscience, but they don't want to surrender to the God of the Bible. So they are moral people, just not Christian people. I believe that is evidenced in the world today. 
We got a lot of people that say, you know what, uh, I may not be a believer, Brandon, I may not be a Christian, but let me tell you something, I try to do right. I try to do the right thing. If, 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 if I think it's the right thing, I will do it. And I try to be more. I try to treat people how that I want to be treated. I try to do the right thing. They are moral people, but will not accept Christianity. There's a lot of folks like that, okay? A lot of folks, maybe a lot of your friends are like that. I'm not a Bible believer, but I try to be a good person. I'm not a Bible believer, but I believe in helping out and helping people and helping the poor. There's a lot of people like that, okay? Now, there's a third aspect, and Paul, who, by the way, Paul was one of the most brilliant men ever to live because Paul was a Roman citizen, but he was born a Jew. He was educated at the feet uh, of uh, Gamaliel, and uh, he, he was educated. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was smart. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the Roman culture, and he merged the two together. And I mean, he's an unbelievable spokesman to the Jew and also to the, to the Gentile. And here's what he says. If you read, he goes and he says there's a third classification of people and it's the religious people it's the religious people who in the name of God do all the right things and keep check and keep tabs on all the right things like did you go to church today yes did you go to the synagogue today yes check uh did you do this today did you read your bible today yes I, I did this did you did they they're keeping track man they're devout did you pay your tithe yes I paid my tithe did you do this yes I, I did this and Paul equated it at the end of chapter 2 to the devout Jews. Because let me tell you something. You do not get more devout to your religion than an orthodox Jew to his religion. Do you understand that? I mean, you on the Sabbath day, there's no work. Okay? You are honoring the feast. You are, are living by the Old Testament. Did you know there's over 600 commands in the Old Testament? You understand that? 600 commands. Okay? 600 commands, and they did their best, and man, they, they, they kept track, and they made sure that they stayed away from the wrong things. Oh, we don't touch dead bodies, and we don't go near dead bodies, and, and, and if somebody's sick, we don't touch them. They're unclean, and man, that Old Testament Jew uh, 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 religion that was there. Paul says, let me tell you something. There's a third classification. There's pagan. There's moral people, but not Christian people. But he said, then there's religious people who, in the name of God, do a lot of things and think that they are righteous because of all the things that they do. Okay? Let me say this. You and I might fit into that classification because if you kind of grew up like I did, man, you kind of put a star by your name and a check mark by your name when you do good things, right? Oh, I, 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 I went to church today. Pat yourself on the back. You went to church today. Oh, I even went on Wednesday night. Oh, there's another pat on the back. Man, Brandon, you are good. Some of us think that God's just up there in heaven, like just blown away at our, our, our devotion to him. Oh, whoa, man, two times in a week, Brandon, you went to church. That's awesome. And some of us, man, we might pull out that tithe check and say, God, <clears throat> you see this, right? All right. Oh, and, and maybe you want everybody else to see it too. So you just kind of uh, pull it out, make a big, say, oh, I got to find my wallet. Yeah, where's that wallet at? Let me pull that out. Make sure everybody see I'm putting in money. Yeah, put my money in. Check. All right. Oh, I got baptized. Everybody see I'm getting baptized. Hey, I'm a member of the church. Hey, I gave extra money to this or to that. Hey, let me help these people who are in need. Everybody see that th that's what the Pharisees did. And let me, can I tell you what? That's what religion does. Can I tell you why religion does that? Let me tell you this. Because religion is trying to find a way to reconcile their self with God. We're trying to impress God. Do you know that? And can I tell you something? I think that comes pretty natural. Doesn't it? I mean, some people's theology makes sense to me. I'm bad. God is good, right? So if I'm going to get to God, I got to get gooder. <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, that's how, that's how people think. And can I tell you something? That makes sense. But the problem is this. Can I tell you? 
The problem that Paul drives home in chapter 1 and chapter 2 is this. It doesn't matter if you're a pagan in a third world country bowing down to an image made of stone. It doesn't matter if you're a moral person but not a Christian person. Or it doesn't even matter if you are a call yourself a religious person just trying to do good deeds and earn your way into God's good graces. He said, you all got a problem. You've all fallen short of the glory of God. You see, you may... You may be bound down to an image over here. You may be bound down and worshiping some graven image. You say, are they a long way from God? Yep, they're a long way from God. But can I tell you something? The moral person that we look at, that refuses to accept Christ and what he's done on the cross, can I tell you something? They're a long way from God. Can I tell you that churches are full today of people who are religious and they're a long way from God? Amen? Amen. Because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want to show you this. Look at Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 1. That's where I had you turn 20 minutes ago, so we're not making very good progress, right? Okay, here we go. Romans 3, verse uh, number 9. Romans 3, verse number 9. What then? Are we better than they? This is just coming out of that section on... On the Jewish devotion, who, man, they put a lot of stock in, in what they're doing and they're devout uh, in their faith. He says, Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are, watch this, all under sin. Notice that. Jews and Gentiles. Paul was a Jew, and Gentile is everybody that's not a Jew, right? It's non Jews. So everybody in the world, Jews and Gentiles, are all under sin. Everybody say all. All. Now notice this right here. Verse number 10. I always use this when I'm leading somebody to Christ. This verse right here. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Nobody's righteous. You know what righteousness is, right? It's perfection. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. No one is righteous. No one is righteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. Verse number 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Do you think Paul's making the point here that nobody, nobody, nobody is perfect in God's sight? It doesn't matter if you're a pagan. doesn't matter if you're religious but not a Christian. doesn't even matter if you're a devout religious person. You are not perfect. Did you know that nine times in three verses he says, all, none, or not one? He says it nine times times in three verses i think he's trying to drive home the point don't you that ain't nobody perfect okay you are not perfect and salvation is not based on your religion it is not based on your morals it is not based on whether you're a pagan or moral person or a religious person. You can fall into any of those categories, but the common denominator of all those categories is that all are sinners. Not one of them is righteous in God's sight. Not one. Remember, God's just and holy. You know what? If you commit one sin, you know what you call that? A sinner. If you commit ten sins... You know what you are? A sinner. You know how many sins you have to commit to be worthy of death? One. So can I tell you something? You go to church. You get your life straightened out. You never commit another sin. Okay? Are you still guilty of death? Yes. Because you've already committed sin. Right? You can't help it. All right? When we, after we get saved, we're supposed to become... We're supposed to sin less, right? We're supposed to become more like Christ. You're never going to become sinless, as one guy said, but hopefully you'll sin less. Becoming more like Christ. Because it is your nature to sin, and we've talked about that internal conflict after salvation of the good versus the evil, the light versus the darkness, the devil pulling you one way and the Lord pulling you another way. But what I'm trying to get you to understand today is nobody is righteous in the sight of God. Nobody. 
Nobody. It doesn't matter if you've gone to church your whole life. It doesn't matter if you've never missed a Sunday. It doesn't matter if you pray all the time. It doesn't matter what you do. It has no influence on if you're righteous or not because everybody, no matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa or Hitler, you're a sinner. Now, I know the next question. Well, there's a big difference in Mother Teresa and Hitler. I understand that. Now, let me tell you something. You ought to get some of the teaching that we teach here because we'll touch things that nobody else will because people say, well, Brandon, I don't believe that it's fair that uh, this person goes to hell and, and that person goes to the same hell and gets the same punishment. They all get death, but nobody said they got the same punishment. Jesus said over and over, he said, he that does this gets the greater damnation. There are levels of punishment even in the lake of fire in hell, okay? By the way, those are two different places. We've, we went in depth on that, okay? I want you to understand that, okay? God is just, all right? You know why you cry out for justice? You know why when you see an atrocity, you say, hey, that person needs to go to jail forever, you know why you do that? Because you're creating the image of God, and that is the justice of God screaming out from inside of you saying, that needs to be addressed. Because you're made in the image of God. That's how he acts. How you think you're made in his image. That's, that's a reaction that God has. Justice. He's holy and he's just. Now watch this, though. Watch this. Verse number uh, 13. So we see that all and none and not one is perfect or righteous in the sight of God. Look at verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Talking about everybody. Everybody. Their throat's an open sepulcher. They have used deceit. They're, the poison of asp is under their lips. What, what he's talking about here is, is he said, you just have to look at how people talk to one another and find out that they're sinners. He said the poison of asp. asp. You know what an asp is? It's a cobra. It's an Egyptian cobra. He said they got the poison in their mouth the way they talk to people. Man, it's just poison like a cobra. Spewing that venom just in how people talk to each other. You don't have to tell me that man's fallen. He said, look at, just look at how they talk to each other. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace have they not known. There's one thing that is common with people that don't know the Lord, that do not have their sins forgiven. They have no peace. Do you know that? You have no peace. Have no peace. Have no peace. And how many times have we looked and saw a famous person that's got all the money in the world, all the houses in the world, all the cars in the, in the world, all the uh, 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 ladies in the world, all the uh, women in the world, all the boyfriends in the world. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've got all the fame and popularity. If you don't have God, you don't have peace. How many times have we seen celebrities take their own lives because they do not have peace in their heart and you can't fill that void with any money. You can't fill that void with a boat or a car or a yacht. You cannot fill it with anything other than God because there's something inside of you that says that that hole in your soul has to be filled with him. Verse number 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. I won't take time to dive into the, the fear of God, but the fear of God is different than the knowledge of God. And it's not afraid of God. It is a respect and an awe for God. And you only get a respect and an awe for God when you walk with him daily in his word. When you walk with him, Moses had a healthy fear of the Lord. The rest of the people were just afraid of God. They had knowledge of God. God doesn't want you to be afraid of him. He wants you to stand in awe of him. And when you walk in the scriptures and you walk in prayer, you will be drawn into a place of awe before God. It's the fear of God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Who's he talking about? Sinners. Now watch this though. Now we know that what things soever the law saith. Notice that word, the law. Those two words. It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now notice this here. Because I don't want you to just read over this verse and say, oh yeah, that's nice, another Bible verse. I want you to understand what God is saying here. How many know the law? Okay, the law, as a Jew would call it, would be the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses, right? Given to the Jew, this is what you're supposed to obey. In the Old Testament alone, there's over 600 commands. The ones that we try to obey are just in Exodus 20, just the first 10. We call them the Ten Commandments. That's part of the law. 
What's the purpose of all that? Why, why did God give Moses the law? Can I, can I answer that for you? Watch this. Now we know that whatsoever things, soever the law saith, it, the law, saith to them who are under the law. Now watch this. Why did God give the law? That every mouth may be stopped. Why did God give the law? Let me paraphrase that into the Brandon Matheson International Version. God gave you the law so you couldn't open your mouth and you had to shut up and stop telling the Lord what you've done. Why did God give you the law? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou honor your father and mother, have no other gods before me. Why did he give all that? So you would stop telling God how good you are. I'm going to get to that in a second. Watch this. He gave you the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty. God gave the law so the whole world would be like, oh, yeah, we're guilty. He said, Brandon, I don't get it. Go to Exodus chapter 20. Since you don't get it, I'll explain it to you. You didn't really say that. Sometimes preachers have conversations with themselves during sermons. Let's see how you do. I'm going to give you a test. You ready for a test? Pop quiz. You ready? Exodus. Let me turn over here because I'm going to blow through these real quick, Paul. I'm not even going to read them all. I'm going to skip down uh, verses. I just want to see how we're doing here, okay? Let's go to the first commandment, okay? Exodus chapter 20. This is what we call the Ten Commandments. How many of you ever heard of the Ten Commandments, right? All right, let's see how we're doing here. I'm going to see how I'm going to do. I'm going to give myself a pop quiz. Here we go. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse number three. I shall have no other gods before me, okay? That's the first commandment, all right? How you doing on that one, okay? Nobody ain't got any statues you're bowing down to, worshiping? Okay, good. So no little G-gods, right? So you're doing good on that one? All right. Let me ask you this. No other gods before me. Let me just kind of go out on a limb and take a very conservative view of this. Um, do you have anything that dominates the number one spot in your life besides God? Do I let anything in that number one spot? So God wants the number one spot. The first commandment is no other gods before me, little g gods. Yeah, that could mean statues and stuff, but it could also mean a fishing boat. Right? It could also mean a job. It could mean the love of money. Right? So, you just ask yourself, just internalize that. How am I doing? Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If I'm honest, I'm already, I'm already out, <laughs> all right? Eh, I'm going to, eh, okay, I'm out, right? Because a lot of times, something else creeps into that number one spot in your life, doesn't it? And if it does, you're, making the, you're breaking the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right, but just, just in case you got by that one, let's go on. Verse number two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. <laughs> I'm good on this one, okay? I didn't make me a statue of anything to worship, did you? Okay, all right, we good? All right, let's move on. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Hmm. I can see your head's wheels turning. Well, Brenda, does that mean if you slip and say a word? Uh, literally what it means is attach God's name to something God has nothing to do with. So if you pronounce a curse on someone and damn someone in God's name, would that qualify? Yeah. Okay. So you just answer that question. Or, and can I say something? L let me hit right here for a second. Okay. And I've got, I've got a laundry list of faults of my own, but let me just pick on something. And, and, and my dad drilled this into my head. And, and, man, I don't like this. Do not use the Lord's name. God, his title. Or Jesus Christ, his son, your savior. Don't use that as a cuss word. I cannot stand that. Don't, don't go, my God. Are you praying? If you ain't praying, why are you attaching God's name to your anger? Because that's what you're saying. You're saying it in frustration. Well, oh, my God. Right? Don't do that. Please don't use Jesus Christ's name. The specific name of the Son of God in a cursing way. Okay? I've actually asked people, hey, do you mind not 
saying that because I, that is one that just, it's nails on a chalkboard to me. Jesus Christ. You hear what I'm saying? You young people, don't you get in a habit of saying that? Because what are you doing? You're attaching God's name to something. He doesn't have anything. You're mad at somebody, and so you're going to use God and drag God's name into it and, and, and use it as an outburst for your anger. Don't do that. So how you doing? We're three commandments in. <laughs> and 90% of us are gone, right? Okay. Let's do this. Remember the Sabbath day. Now, this is Jewish commandments, right? Remember the Sabbath day. So have one day a week where you don't work. You set it aside. That's God's day. Okay. <laughs> Let's try five. Teenagers, <clears throat> honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land. Verse 12. Sorry, Paul. I got to tell you more. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gave, giveth thee. Honor thy father and thy mother. Uh-oh. 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 That means back talk. That means disrespect. That means talking about them behind their back. That means yelling at them, cussing at them, saying I hate you. All that kind of stuff that I see from kids. And by the way, not just kids out there in the world, but kids at Catalyst. You, hey, let me tell you something. We're four commandments in, you're gone. Right? You ain't perfect. Five, five commandments. Now what's this? Did you know that those, those are the first five? Then you get to the ones you know. Because if I had said, hey, name me a commandment, you would have said, don't kill. That's the first one. That's always the first one. Right? Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Those are always the first two. But did you know there's first five and they're in order? No other gods before me. Right? No graven images. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and honor your father and mother. Do you know that the first five deal with how you treat other people? The last five, right? It, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The first five deal with how you treat God in your authority that's over you. The last five deal with how you treat people. Don't kill, don't steal, don't destroy, commit adultery, all that. Because that's how you treat other people. The first five, if you treat God the right way, you won't treat people bad. God put them in order on, on, on purpose. But let's look at the last five and see how you're doing, okay? Thou shalt not kill. Anybody? All right, okay. All right, I just, I just had to check, okay? I had to check. All right? Because I'm obligated now to turn you in, okay? I just want you to know. Thou shalt not commit adultery, okay? You say, oh, Brandon, I'm good, okay? Thou shalt not steal. You ever stole anything? Have you ever stole anything? Anything that did not belong to you? Money out of dad's wallet. Hold on. Time from your boss. Oh, Brandon, you're getting technical now. I wish you'd stick to preaching and stop meddling in my business, okay? Milk in the clock. You stole an answer that wasn't yours off the test. You see where I'm going with this, right? Thou shalt not steal. We're eight in. Let's check nine and ten. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That means lie. <laughs> Apparently we just lost another one, okay? Now, you say, Brandon, I haven't killed. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't done this. I haven't done this. Look at the last one. Okay, verse number 17, thou shalt not covet. Have you ever looked at anything that wasn't yours and said, I want that? Everybody does that. You may have been good on adultery part. Oh, I've never committed adultery, Brandon. Have you ever thought about it and wanted to? <laughs> Brandon, quit meddling, okay? Right? Because God deals with how we treat him, how we treat others, and then what you even think? Why? Go back. Go back. Romans chapter number 3. Romans 3. And look at that verse again. Look at this. Romans chapter 3. Verse number 19. The law is given that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. I just went through 10 of the commandments. Can I tell you how many more there are in the Old Testament? 590. You really want to try to measure up? 
What's the purpose of all that? It's to show you that you can't measure up, guys. Do you understand that? There's no way you can measure up. I, if that's the standard, if I've got to measure up to go to heaven, if I've got to measure up to have the righteousness of God given to me, I am done. Do you understand that? You know the first step to salvation is admitting you're a sinner. Do you know nobody can ever be saved if they do not admit they're a sinner? Man, I loved, I loved, oh my goodness. How many watched Billy Graham's funeral this week? Oh my goodness. If you didn't, go watch it. Go watch you. Oh my goodness. Billy Graham's daughter, I like Franklin. I've, I've heard him speak live. I mean, he, he's a great guy. His daughter though? He's got two daughters. That, the, the, oh my goodness, that one daughter, I thought she was, had been to Wednesday night Bible study. She said, let me tell you something. She preached the rapture right there. You better be ready for the rapture of God. And she, t- I mean, she talked about sin and how you need to repent of your sin and come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. I loved the fact that on TV channels, it is broadcasting, okay, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank God. Thank God that America still has enough decency to honor the greatness of, of such a man who preached the gospel. Can I tell you something? For 70 years. I'll throw this out to you, by the way, by the way too. And something to think about. It's kind of just a quinky dink. You know what a quinky dink is? I don't believe in them, but here, here's the deal. You know that Billy Graham's, and I'm not saying, I'm not like, I, you know, I don't lift people up and, oh, this is a saint or that's a saint. I don't believe in all that. Men are men, but some people are used by God. And Billy Graham was used by God to preach the gospel and personally over to 200 million people. Did you know Billy Graham's ministry started in the fall, late 1947, and, and he ended 2018? He was 99 years old, right at 100 years old. But his ministry spanned almost exactly 70 years. Can I tell you something else? It spanned the exact time that Israel was recognized as a nation for the first time in 2,000 years until now and this spring, Israel will celebrate its 70th anniversary as a nation. And America is going to honor Israel by recognizing our embassy and Jerusalem as the capital of Israel all in that same year. And then I heard Billy Graham's daughter said this, and I started, I started researching it. Do you know what day of the year Jews read song, uh, read and sing and celebrate the life of Moses? Because they remember that as the day that Moses died and went to be with the Lord. And they remember him to this day and they have special readings that they read. February 21st, the exact day that Billy Graham died. Isn't that crazy? What if he was the Moses for this generation? Okay. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Let me, let me show you something. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Look at that. So what can you do? The deeds of the law. Okay? Honor your father and mother. Remember the Sabbath day. Don't kill. Don't steal. Destroy. First one. No other gods before me. What? Which one of those can you do to be justified? Remember what justified. I taught you last week what justified is. What's, what's justified? Declared righteous. It means just as if you'd never sinned, right? Justified. What can you do to be justif- justified Excuse me, in the eyes of God? Nothing. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified in the sight of God. No flesh. Do you understand that? Do you understand that we have religions around the world and I don't want us to fall into that same trap that think that our actions somehow impress God to the point where he says, hey, you're going to, okay, you can come to heaven. Do you understand? You say, Brandon, you've preached this ever since Catalyst has been a church. Yes, and I'm going to keep preaching it. You know why? Because people still don't get it. Most people, if I sit down and say, if you died today, are you going to heaven? You know what that'd say? Yep, I am. Why? Well, let me tell you. Well, you know, I come from a good family. My mom, she was a saint. Now tell me about their mom. And I'm like, man, I bet she was. How about you?
Well, I tried to do my best, and I turned over a new leaf. I used to be real wild, and I got my life straightened out, and I got on the straight and narrow, and I started going to church, and that's when I started coming to church. I'm not asking you about all that. I'm asking you, if you stood before God right now, and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? Are you going to tell him about your mama and how good she was? Are you going to tell him about what your papa did? Are you going to tell him about what you did? Are you going to tell him about how you turned over a new leaf? Let me tell you something. If that's your plan, that's not going to impress. The Bible says the righteousness, my righteousness, is filthy rags in his sight. That verse in the Old Testament, can, can I tell you what that means? They used to have rampant leprosy. And the lepers would walk around the city and they had to stay sectioned off in their part of the city. And in their part of the city, they would have poles and rags hanging on the poles so the people could go by and pick up that rag and wipe the pus and the rottenness off of themselves and put it back up on that rag for the next person to use. When he says you're filthy rags, the righteous, the best you can do is filthy rags. That's what he's, that's what he's drawing on right there. It's a nasty, old, dirty rag used for disgusting purposes. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You know what the purpose of the law is? To get you to say, huh, if I'm going to be perfect, that's, I got to do all that. Can I tell you something? If you, if you want to be perfect, go obey all 600 of the commandments. You remember the guy that came to Jesus and he said, I'm rich. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Remember? And it seems like a contradiction because he's like, hey, you got to keep all the law. And the guy's like, yep, done it. <laughs> right? He's like, yep, done that, Lord. What do I need to do now? <laughs> Jesus said, go sell everything you've got and come follow me. And I read that and I'm like, Jesus is saying he can work his way to heaven if he just gives away all his stuff. And that's not what he's saying. He's saying, son, you think you've obeyed all the law and the prophets. You fell at number one. You got a God that's bigger than me in your life and it's called your money. So you go give it away, get rid of that God, then you can get saved. That's what he's saying. You got a huge sin and it's you got a God before me. Now watch this. This is pretty cool right here. Look at verse number 21. But now, so we've established that nobody's perfect, right? Have we established that? Do you think Paul drove it home enough? None, zero, not one. All have sinned. He says it nine times in three verses. Look at this, verse 21. But now, notice this words, the righteousness of God is without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Look at verse 22. Now watch this. So remember that, the righteousness of God. We're going to come back there. Verse number 22. Even the righteousness of God. There's that little phrase again. Which is by faith or through faith of Jesus Christ unto how many? All. And upon how many? All them that believe. For there is no difference. For how many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So everybody sinned. And what does he say? He says the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he said in verse 22. Now, what's this? Verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare, watch this, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, verse 26, I say at this time, what? His righteousness, that he might be just in the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. If you're, not, if you're picking up on this, in those, that little section of verses, four times Paul says something. He says, the righteousness of God twice, and he says, his righteousness twice. Can I tell you something? When you got saved and born again and you were declared righteous, remember that's what we talked about last week? You are justified in the eyes of God. What happens? Okay? And I always tell my kids, okay? You had a sinful record, right? You are a sinner. 
Jesus went to the cross and died for you. And what did he do? He took your sin and he gave you his perfection, right? And he switched with you. And so now you don't have a sin record. Jesus took your sin and washed it all the way, all away by the power of the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And now you have a clean, spotless, white, white record. Can I tell you why you have that? Because those four verses tell us four times Paul says, when you got saved and justified, God gave you his righteousness. Whose? Whose? Everybody say his on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. His righteousness. Whose righteousness is it? It's his. Okay, now hold on. All right? So if he gives me his righteousness and there's this switch at salvation, it's his righteousness, right? See, because you've been thinking you were made righteous, and when you screw up again and mess up again, oh, I just blew that one because I was righteous. Now I'm, well, I got a little mark, check mark on there, right? No, 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 you, you're misunderstanding. When you got saved, you were not given a, your clean slate and your righteousness. You were given the righteousness of God. It's his perfection. He gave you his clean record. And last time I checked, he hadn't sinned. Last time I checked, he hadn't lied. Last time I checked, he hadn't coveted. Last time I checked, he hadn't killed anybody. Last time I checked, he didn't, he didn't lust. Last time I checked, he didn't lie. He was given, you were given his righteousness at salvation. That, I don't know if you understand that, but that is a huge deal. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with him. Are you with me? It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with him. I cannot believe, and let me tell you something. I cannot believe how many of us Christians are not clear on salvation and what happens at salvation. And am I, do I stay saved? Does it come and does it go? I cannot believe it. Let me tell you something. You are to be an expert on salvation. You better know what justification is that you're declared righteous. You better know that you receive the righteousness of God. You better know that. You've got to be an expert on it. I've been teaching you a lot about prophecy and this and that. Let me tell you something. Throw all that out the window. I want you to know that stuff. I want you to learn it. But if you don't even know how to tell somebody to get saved still, forget prophecy and learn salvation. Amen? we got to be experts on it. There's a lost and dying world. I love Billy Graham. Let me tell you something. He preached a very simple message. He didn't get out in the weeds a whole lot. When he was pre preaching those big stadiums, what did he do? He preached the message of salvation, salvation, salvation. Even to this day, when you see an interview with anybody from that organization, whether it's Franklin or anybody, what do they do? If they go on the news, if they go on Fox or CNN, every time they speak, they give the plan of salvation somewhere in their answer. Why? Because we are here to lead people to Christ. And you better know how to do that. Okay? You better know how to do that. You better know how to do that. You better know how to tell your kids how to be saved. Okay? You would be shocked at how many preachers don't know how to tell somebody to be saved. I remember one time I moved a preacher over and out of the way because he was dealing with somebody at the altar. And you know what his answer was? He walked up, prayed, put his hand on him. Oh, Lord, save him. Oh, Lord, save him. Oh, Lord, save him, he'd say. I guess his louder his voice, the more likely it was that God was going to just come down and save him. You know what I did? I said, move. And I took my Bible and I showed him. I said, if you want to be saved, here's what God said. If you want to call on the Lord, here's what the Bible says, how you get saved. Because I can say all day, oh, Lord, save him. Oh, Lord, save him. I can cry and plead and scream and holler. And he ain't going to get saved. You got to tell him. You got to show him. And you moms and dads and you grandmas and grandpas, you better know how to tell your young people, your teenagers, your kids how to be saved. You better know it. You better know it. If you, Man, God help us. If I'm a lost person, I'm like, hey, how do I get saved? You remember in the, in the New Testament when the guy's like, hey, what must I do to be saved? Thank God somebody was, the answer was there. Because today I don't know if we'd find a Christian that knows how to tell them. 
And let me, let me say something. If you don't know how to tell somebody to be saved, you do not inspire my confidence that you have been saved, okay? If you don't know what happened to you, you see what I'm saying? Are y'all alive? All right? All right. So let me finish this up, wrap this up. Look at this. End of verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. Remember, it's his righteousness you get at salvation. Now watch this. That he might be just. Remember what I told you at the beginning? What is God? He is holy and he is just. Watch this though. Back up to verse 26. That he might be just and what? The justifier. Do you know that in salvation, God plays a dual role. He plays the one who is just in handing out the punishment and the holiness But he also plays another role. He's the justifier. He's just and he's the justifier. Amen. You know why? Because he's just, his holiness was appeased. His justice was paid for at the cross. Why? The wages of sin is death. What was paid at Calvary for sin? Death. It was placed on the Lamb of God. God came up. You, you and I will never know what it costs God to save our souls. Because let me tell you something. I don't, it was the nails. It was the spear in his side. It was the death. It was the torture and the cat of nine tails and all that. But I believe that it was so much more than just the physical pain. It was the weight of sin, yours and mine, that was placed on him that Jesus paid on that cross. Because God had to pour out his wrath for sin on his son in order to save us so we didn't have to endure it for eternity. He poured it out on Jesus. That's why the earth quaked. That's why the sky went dark. That's why Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time in scripture that he references his father as God. Why? Because he was not standing as a son. He was standing as a God and a person being judged by God. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would you turn your back on me? God had to turn his back on his own son and pour out all of his wrath on that cross to save you and me. So God could be what? Just. Sin has been paid for. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to let you off the hook with your sin. No, it was paid for at the cross. And God is just. His justice is satisfied. And he's also the justifier. Amen. Let me, let me show you two verses and I'm done. John chapter number 5. I was showing my kids this this week, and this is pretty cool. John chapter number 5. I want to show you this. If you want to know uh, one of the best verses on your eternal security, look at this verse. Verily, verily. Anytime you see that little phrase there, you know what God's saying? Jesus is saying, hey, listen up, listen up, listen up. That's what he's doing. Verily, verily. When you say, I want attention, like attention. But when you really want attention, like, hey, attention, attention. Hey, that's what verily means. Verily, verily. Listen up. He says this, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Amen. How many have ever heard the word of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection? How many have heard it here today? How many have heard it in your life, right? Who knows how many times we've heard it? The Bible says if you hear it and you believe on him that sent Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. Is that not what it says? Now look at that verse. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath. That is in the present tense. Okay? Let me tell you something. You are not going to die one day and find out if you're going to heaven. If you have heard the word and the good news of Jesus, placed your faith in him, you have everlasting life and it's going right now. It started the moment you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? You are saved today. You have everlasting life, okay? You will never die, okay? Yeah, this body might die, but you, this ain't me. I am what is inside here, this soul and this spirit, and it will never, ever, ever, ever die. Why? Because I have everlasting life, and I've had it since October 23rd, 1988, amen? I have it right now. Now watch this. 
He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Amen. You will not come into judgment. By the way, what's the tribulation as we've been talking about on Wednesday nights? It's the judgment of God. Amen. You as the church, there's a mystery surrounding the church. That's why I believe you will not be here for the judgment that God's going to pour out on the earth. You're going to be gone. And that's what it says. I'm kind of homesick. I've never been this homesick before because you are a citizen of heaven. You are not of this earth. And God said, I'm not going to pour out my judgment or my condemnation on you because you have believed in me. Amen. You are saved, but it's passed from death into life. Now watch this. John chapter number 10. Look at this last verse. Last two verses. And I give unto them eternal life. Just to Jesus talking. Now watch this. I love this. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Amen. Now watch this. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now watch this. So what Jesus said. And I love it. You know what Jesus wanted. You know what he called the believers in him? Those to the Father, he said, those that you have given me. When he prayed, he said, those that you have given me. At the end of his ministry, he said, I haven't lost one of them. You know why? Because Jesus don't lose people that believe in him. Amen? Watch what he says. He says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Can I tell you something? If you're saved here today from the moment you got saved and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you know you're a sinner and you admitted it. You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, I, I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. You were buried and rose from the dead. And I believe it. And I trust you to save me. The Bible says you are placed in the hand of Jesus Christ and he watches over you. And ain't nobody can mess with you. Ain't nobody can pull you out of his hand. You are there. Amen. Amen. Now watch this verse though. Next verse. Watch this. Next verse. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. Somebody say amen to that. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. You are described as being in the hand of Jesus. And God's hand is wrapped around Jesus' hand. There ain't nobody can mess with you. Ain't nobody can get you out of Jesus' hand. And just to double check and double seal it, ain't nobody can pull you out of the Father's hand, he said. There's two hands mentioned here. You're in Jesus' hand, and you're in God, the Father's hand. Nobody can mess with you. But let me tell you something. You're a sinner. Quit trying to measure up and impress God with your deeds because you can't do it. Go to God and say, you know what, God? You've given me your righteousness, and I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But I want to please you today with my life because you've been so good to me. You've been so good to me. See, a lot of people are afraid to preach. What I've told you here this morning, a lot of preachers are saying, well, people just go out and sin because it's all washed away and it's all on Jesus. And man, there, there ain't nothing to do to lose it. Nobody can. Oh, you know what? When you really understand salvation, you don't, you don't want to do that. It's like having a good mama and a daddy. That would give you anything and the shirt off their back and they'd take care of you and give you any need that you need. You know what? You love them and you don't want to abuse them. You don't want to take advantage of them. You want to love them. You want to respect them. Amen. God, your father's like that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for Romans chapter 3 and the apostle Paul that teaches us so much about salvation. And Lord, we could spend, we could spend a year on chapter 1, 2, and 3 and we just kind of summarized it here this morning. You're so good to us. You saved us. You gave us your righteousness, and we didn't deserve it because we didn't have any righteousness of our own. We're sinners. We're fallen. Help us to understand that today, but help us to, help us to not do our good deeds to gain your approval or to gain heaven or salvation, but help, them to, to help us to do those good deeds to bring glory and honor to your name and so others might see you through how we live our lives. Help us to do our good deeds so people can see our God and glorify him. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask you this. If you're here today and you say, Brandon, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I don't know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. But I sure would like to know. I would like to know. And something on the inside of me, my heart is pounding. And I, I want to know that I'm saved. And I'm just not sure that I'm saved. Nobody's looking around. Would you be real honest with me and just slip up your hand and say, Brandon, pray for me. I won't embarrass you. I won't single you out. Brandon, I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. Anybody like that?
I'll give you just a moment. Just slip up your hand. I, I, I always want to give an opportunity for anyone to be saved. Amen. Amen. If you're here this morning, you say, Brandon, the Lord spoke to me through the message, and I just want you to pray for me. He touched my heart this morning. And uh, uh, in this reminder message of how good God is and his salvation and his righteousness that's been given to me. And God just spoke to me this morning. Brandon, remember me in prayer. Just slip up your hand this morning. I see those hands. Remember me, Brandon, in prayer. All right. Father, we love you. We need you. We want, we're going to depart here, Lord. The church is going to leave this building. But this church goes out into the world. And we are the church. We're the hands and feet. We're the body of Christ. Help us as we go this week. Help us to be an encouragement to people. Help us to love people. Help us to take and show all the attributes that you've given to us. Your love, your mercy, your grace, your long-sufferingness. Everything that you've given to us. Help us to apply your holiness in our lives. Help us to, to take everything that we've learned from you, internalize it, and live it outwardly. Help us to be the light of the world this week as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.